Hello, Sander. Hello, Kevin. In uh, FM Alexander's books, he talks about orders a lot or uh, directions. And there seems to be two types of guiding orders he talks about. There's preventive orders, and then there seems to be other orders that are to be carried out after the preventive orders, which aren't to be carried out. And this may have caused some confusion in the modern Alexander technique. So what's your understanding of the orders, the two types of guiding orders, and what do you mean by preventive orders? Yes, so uh, there is a, a confusion, and uh, now the confusion is even uh, has reached a new level in the modern Alexander technique, where uh, the orders, the only orders that are considered are let the neck be free, to let the head go forward and up, to let the back lengthen and widen. And uh, du during our last conversation, I explained that for Alexander, um, neck free, head forward and up, back to lengthen and widen are preventive orders. Uh, they are orders which uh, would lead the person, if instead of merely framing the orders in the mind, if the person uh, attempts the physical performance of these, of these acts, or try to remember the feeling associated with the performance of these acts, which for Alexander is the same thing, uh, the person will invariably, in fact, uh, uh, be guided by his faulty sensory appreciation, even if he's been, he's had uh, hundreds and hundreds of lessons. It was my case when I finished my training course. I had lessons with, uh, of course, uh, my teachers. I had lessons in other schools. I had lessons with first generation teachers. And uh, when I started to uh, use videos to, in fact, uh, film the workshops I was giving, I was very surprised to discover that uh, when I was working, which is at the moment when I really uh, wanted to transmit a proper coordination. It could be seen on video that uh, uh, I was not lengthening the spine, I was arching the back. Uh, there was many different misdirected activities which indicated that uh, my sensory appreciation was still completely faulty. So Alexander, when he talks about uh, framing these preventive orders in the mind, uh, he, he says that uh, these are ends and not means. Let the neck be free should be a result of a coordination of the movements of the different parts of the mechanism of the torso. This is uh, uh, indicated uh, black and white. I showed uh, uh, in the last episode, I showed the, the image where Alexander says that uh, uh, instead of uh, stiffening the neck muscles, the, the pupil should use uh, verbal orders, neck free or neck to be free or let the neck be free. And uh, this is an order of inhibition. You should prevent yourself from doing anything from the neck. And then he says the true uses of the mechanism, the means of placing the mechanism of the torso in a position of mechanical advantage must be studied. So there are two kinds of orders. And um, I, while we were discussing this a minute ago, I prepared a quote. And I want to read that quote so that uh, it's clear for everyone that this not, is not an invention. I have opened Constructive Conscious Control, the second book of Alexander, right page one, 101. And uh, here is what Alexander is, say, is saying. It follows then that the orders which are to be given, but not to be carried out, are those which, if carried out, would result in the habitual faulty use of the mechanisms. They can therefore be referred to as preventive orders. All orders which follow preventive orders are to be carried out at first by the teacher, for if the teaching technique is reliable, such order will be concerned with the correct means whereby 
the new and coordinated use of the mechanism can be secured. So apparently for Alexander, there are these new orders, which are orders which, which have to be ultimately carried out by the pupil. But at first the teacher is, uh, is going to help. And um, this is uh, repeated by Alexander uh, when he says that um, the teacher must ask the pupil to rehearse the orders necessary to the particular person in question. And such mental orders or desires must be those which be in accordance with the correct movements which the teacher will ensure for the pupil during the manipulation which follow. Which means here that uh, the orders necessary for the particular person in questions are not generic orders that make free at forward and up, back to length and widen. These are not personal. These are orders for everyone. Everyone that is going to have a, a lesson of Alexander Technique will hear these orders. They are not particular to the particular person in question. So to me, these are uh, new orders. And the, the, the pupil is asked to rehearse his orders because uh, in fact, uh, the correct movements are going first to be performed uh, by the teacher, to be carried out by the teacher. Yes, that's, uh, that's what Alexander is explaining. So we are discussing real physical acts. We are discussing the performance of physical acts. When we say that the, the technique is about coordination, readjustment and education, uh, it's coordination of movements. Uh, it's, uh, for me, something that you can carry out, what you are to carry out are movements. And by the way, uh, if you follow Alexander's idea of preventive orders, you will find out, reading closely the books, that what Alexander uh, requests the pupil to inhibit, well, of course, it's the idea of, uh, of letting the neck be free. But more than that, it's uh, a movement that the pupil must inhibit. Alexander explained, I think it's a Bedford lecture, that um, uh, the person is pulling the head back. There is a person on stage, Alexander is uh, offering a presentation of his work, and there is a person on stage and he's talking about the position of the person, and uh, the person is obviously pulling the head backward. And uh, Alexander explains that using a preventive order, it is possible to prevent the movement of pulling the head back. It's uh, therefore clear that we are discussing movement that we do not want to see, and there are also movement that we want to see. Movement that concerted together, which means not one movement after the other, a coordination is made of simultaneous movements. So Alexander is talking of a physical act of coordination. And that's, that's, that's where I want to start uh, today to explain my view on the new orders. Of course, in the initial Alexander technique, I consider that the essential part of my work with the pupil is to make the pupil understand these uh, new orders, make the pupil understand the mechanics, how they work, so that when the pupil is going to perform these different actions at the same time, the mind of the pupil can be guided by a very clear model of what it is we intend. The new orders, at first, our intentions, intentions of movements. And I need to explain how this is, uh, uh, well, constructed during the lesson so that people can, can get a better idea of what it is uh, than the way of teaching a long distance lesson. 
So I'm going to start with uh, this uh, idea of uh, physical acts that the pupil has to perform. And uh, for that, we need um, a cri criterion. How are we to define correct and incorrect acts? It's quite simple. Alexander has paved the way for us. So I'm going to start with a very interesting sentence that is in constructive conscious control. And uh, that is what Alexander is saying. On the one hand, in what would ordinarily be considered purely physical spheres, that is the performance of physical acts, the standard of functioning depends upon the degree of correctness of the conception of the act to be performed, and second, upon the degree of coordinated employment of the guiding and controlling orders or directions and of the mechanisms involved in carrying out the activities essential to the correct means whereby the act can be performed. We have already seen this sentence, but I find it so important that I wanted to come back to it. So we are clearly uh, discussing the performance of physical acts and uh, what the new orders are about. They are about describing. Uh, it's a narrative. It's something you, you know about the functioning of the mechanism, well, the mechanical or the physical functioning of the mechanism. And that can explain both why it is that uh, there are misdirected activities and how we are going to go about changing the misdirected activities. And uh, uh, the best uh, for that is to, for example, take one after the other. The first one is the degree of correctness of the conception of the act to be performed. So w when you uh, observe the end of FM Alexander's lessons, you find out that uh, is after a very definite shape that uh, creates a, a very strange relationship between uh, the middle torso, the upper torso, and the head. As you can see, is very intent in uh, changing what he called the poise of the chest. And so uh, there is uh, there are physical acts that are necessary, that Alexander has to, in fact, uh, guide with his hands in order to obtain the poise of the chest and a very particular relationship between the mechanism of the arm and the mechanism of the torso that is in indicated on the right, uh, on the picture on the right. The first thing that we see is that uh, the neck, the base of the neck is very far forward of the back. Uh, this is quite different from uh, the modern conception of what we mean by lengthening the back. There is very often this uh, uh, long back idea that you get when you're lying down supine on a table. Uh, very often you will find that uh, the teacher has no idea of this pose of the chest. So I'm going to come back to this and I will show how many, well, the number of movements that are necessary to be carried out in order to obtain that form, that shape. Because you have to remember something is that Alexander says you, the pupil should study the means, the means whereby obtaining these relationship between the different parts. Well, when Alexander is uh, placing his hands, he's in fact not helping the student to study the means. The pupil is, uh, is studying the position. I mean, the pupil has a, a very uh, strong impression of a feeling impression of the new position. But the means, the means to obtain this position are completely different. Whether you are manipulating the ideas in your head, these intentions of movements of the different parts which concerted together bring about that 
relationship between the parts. And if you are using your hands to progressively, uh, well, induce the pupil to follow your lead. Because when the pupil follow your lead, because you have got only two hands, but it's, un it's impossible to be everywhere at once. So Alexander is seen promoting some relationships somewhere with two hands, then quickly going somewhere else uh, between the neck and head, for example, or between the back and shoulder, and uh, then coming back to see if uh, the new manipulation has not modified something is done before. So uh, it's a completely different position from uh, in the initial Alexander technique, when I ask a person to readjust the different movements, for example, applied on the rib cage, well, these movements have to be done in two seconds. It's not an additive process. I'm not asking the person to take care first of the lower part of the rib cage, then of the middle part of the rib cage, then of the upper part of the rib cage. No, uh, the idea is to transmit to the pupil an understanding of the motions that are involved in this readjustment, readjustment of the poise of the chest and of the poise of the rib cage. And so um, more, more and more I started to see that, yes, I could understand why it had been so difficult for Alexander, for Alexander students, for this first teacher to, to understand what he meant to understand why he didn't want to teach them how to put hands. He wanted them to manipulate these uh, concepts in their mind, these intentions of movement in their mind, in order to consider them all together. This is why uh, the shape you can see now, when you, you, you go to a conference of the Alexander Technique or you go on the internet and start to look around at how teachers are using the mechanism of the torso, you will not see anything like this. And that is because uh, uh, the pupil have not realized uh, what were in fact the essential acts that Alexander was talking about. Because we've seen he's talking about essential acts. And so I considered that these essential acts, and this is what I teach the pupil that have lessons with me is how to reorganize the pose of the torso and the poise of the chest. This is the word, these are the words Alexander is using. So Alexander is talking about the degree of correctness of the conception of the act to be performed. So there is an act to be performed that is seen here is lengthening the back, lengthening the torso lengthening and widening the torso. And I consider that in what he does, Alexander is strictly following his idea, he is lengthening the back and he's widening the back. So it's necessary to have a conception of the act to be performed. And uh, Alexander help us with that. And I will show you that this sentence, the degree of correctness of the conception of the act to be performed is uh, exemplified in his, in his books. Yes, it's not easy to find, but you will see it's, uh, it, it's, it's plain black and white. So here is a little sentence, a little consideration will show that any alteration in the spine must necessarily affect the position and working of the ribs. Uh, every time I read that sentence, I find it quite funny because in fact, what Alexander has in mind is exactly the reverse of that principle. He's, uh, he's de developed a method by which uh, when you work on the ribs, you affect the position of the vertebrae that are associated with it directly. Let me show you. Uh, this is um, what we call the costal transversal joint. It's the joint between the, the rib and the vertebrae. And uh, we see the vertebrae from above. And what we see is that first, the bony organization is such that if the back end of the rib is moved backward in space, we will see that the vertebrae that is in fact in connection with it, directly with it, will have to move backward. Exactly 
in the same proportion. That means there is no degree of freedom from the front to the back when the ribs are moving back, the vertebrae is moving back. Well, this is not really interesting when we are talking about one movement. Of course, you can pull, uh, for example, the center of the torso forward and you know that the, the spine at the back is going to be pulled forward. That's really interesting. But it becomes interesting when uh, you discover that you can order more than one movement. You can think of uh, different levels, height of the vertebrae related each with a rib and uh, therefore you have a means to control the length of well the the back if that's uh, that's the idea uh, here we see alexander is saying these two actions the reeducation of the kinesthetic systems and the increasing in the of the thoracic capacity which applies a mechanical power by means of the muscles of the rib and ribs to the straightening of the spine. Here we've got the idea, applying a mechanical power by means of the muscle and ribs to the straightening of the spine are both aspects of one central idea and are not separate and divisible acts. This is uh, in man's supreme inheritance also. So what, what, is, what is it we see? Well, we see that um, there is, uh, Alexander talks often about the, the front end of the rib. So you have the front end of the rib, then you have a small cartilage, and then you have uh, the sternum bone in the center. And we see again the same shape. We have the vertebrae part of the spine at the back. And we see that, of course, uh, the vertebrae is directly connected. And there is not only the bone geometry, but there are also many ligaments around uh, the rib that are strongly connecting the ribs to the vertebrae. So I said, if you're having some ribs going back, the vertebrae is going to go back. If other ribs are in fact directed in the opposite direction forward, you will see that the vertebrae is going to go forward also. So when you observe Alexander's hands, well, uh, the front hand is on the front end of the ribs, of course. And uh, you may think that he's just directing the front of the torso. Well, in fact, it's not exactly the case, but you have to understand that the ribs have an angle. The, the ribs that are connected with the hump, the, well, here, this uh, color is showing what was called the hump. You have to understand that the, the first ribs are connected with the top of the hemp, while this hand is, in fact, a hand that is related, of course, with vertebrae, but uh, the ribs are below Alexander's left hand. So with these two hands, you may not know it, but it's possible to control, in fact, the relationship between the back and the back of the, the back of the middle torso and, of course, the back of the neck. So Alexander, when he uses his hands, he knows what he's doing. He knows exactly what mechanical action is transmitting through the different parts, as is, of course, directing both hands at the same time, we can call of concerted movements to expand the, the torso. Uh, there, there are many people that don't understand that uh, this is expanding the chest <clears throat> because uh, their uh, conception of expanding the, the chest is in lying uh, supine on a table. When you lie supine, what will happen is first of all, the shoulders, instead of being far forward, off uh, the front of the shoulder, forward of the, of the sternum, forward of the ribs, you will get the shoulder to pull back, to narrow the back because the shoulder blades are going to go toward the spine. So there is a problem with semi-supine about the widening of the upper back, but there is even more problem is that when you go in semi-supine, the tendency would be if we were to look at the person in your mind and rotate the person so that the person is seen uh, up, upright, 
you know, the person is lying down, but you imagine what you would see. What you would see when the person is lying down is that the top of the sternum is very much further back the bottom of the sternum. It's a condition that Alexander described as unduly lifting the front part of the chest. The supine position restrict the breathing. Uh, you must all have heard that uh, in the present pandemic of COVID-19, uh, it has been discovered that uh, to prevent um, pulmonary deficiencies in people uh, with uh, severe forms of COVID-19, it was better to have them lie down in prone. When you lie in prone, your sternum is going to be seen horizontal on the bed, of course. And uh, if you were to rotate the person in your mind, you will find that when the person is rotated, uh, you would find exactly, uh, I, I have a, a, a nice drawing here that shows that this is the position in prone. And uh, when you have this position in prone, of course, you will find different things. We, you will find, first of all, that the head is very far forward from the middle of the back. Yes, you will find also that, um, uh, of course, you are expanding the rib cage to conform with the particular shape of the expanded lungs. So uh, I do really consider that uh, primary to breathing exercises, it's necessar necessary to have a clear understanding of uh, how we can use mechanical power uh, by means of uh, using the ribs to the straightening of the spine. So this is a conception that is uh, uh, something you, you need to learn. You need to have an intellectual approach to that. So when the pupil is coming, it's my job. So I have here an example. Uh, I may show, in fact, uh, uh, this is a, a first lesson with a person that has already had a modern Alexander Technic lessons, and, uh, but he's not a teacher. And uh, then I asked the person to uh, locate the very front of the pelvic bone. I asked the person to use the index finger and to place the index finger on the up, uh, superior anterior iliac spine, which is the front of the pelvis. I want to know where the front of the pelvis is, and it's not always easy with closes. So I ask the person to, to point the index finger and find this bone. I give instructions so that the person can follow a story and uh, inevitably, invariably find this spot. We want to know where the bony spot is because in the conscious guidance lessons, we want to control movements, but you cannot control movements of uh, muscles. You, well, you cannot control easily. You cannot consciously control easily muscles and ligaments and any fascia because uh, one of their characteristics is to change shape when they move. They change shape when, when they narrow, they change shape when they lengthen. So it makes it uh, enormously difficult to control anything by how the muscle is activated and where, it, where it's going. While with bony spots, well, of course, you can place your finger on it or you could place a ruler on it to measure the distance to a wall and you would be made absolutely certain whether you're touching or not. And if there is a movement and at first you're not touching, then if after having done the movement you are touching, it means that you have really made a conscious act of directing that spot into a new relationship with the other spots. So what we see is the, uh, we have uh, secure understanding of the position of the front of the lower torso. And as well, there is a spot, there are spots that are very easy for anybody to locate. For example, here we have the bottom of the sternum, the lower sternum and the upper sternum. So this is fine. Now what we want, we want to observe how the person is uh, using the, the whole anatomical structure in standing. And so what we have in standing is uh, what is uh, often called 
an inverted pendulum. Let me explain. We consider that we have a rotation point at the ankle. And uh, above that rotation point, we have different bony parts that are stacked together. And uh, of course, uh, there is an equilibrium problem in uh, standing. The person has to provide at any moment a solution to the equilibrium problem. And so the first thing I, I observe is what is the actual solution that the person is providing to, for the postural problem. And here, there are things that we can say very simply that, can, that, that we can see even with the steam image, it's apparent. When the person is standing, the person is requested to put a finger on, that's the action, the activities that I'm requesting of the pupil is to put a finger on the front of the pelvic bone. When the person is doing, doing this, uh, we can observe that the rib cage pose is particular. We can observe that the pose of the torso is such that uh, the front of the rib cage, remember the front of the rib cage is associated of course with the spine, with the vertebrae at that, that is connected to that height. Yes, so we see that the front of the middle rib cage is quite far forward of the top and even further forward of the front of the iliac. While we know that uh, this iliac bone is related with the sacrum, which is the base of the spine. There are vertebrae there. So if the sacrum is here and the front of the sternum bone is in forward relatively to it, well, there is something you must know is that nowadays, well, now, uh, after my explanation, it's absolutely obvious that the thoracic vertebrae is much further forward than the lower spine. And because the, the, part, the upper portion of the sternum bone is further back, you are describing a curve. The back can be the, the, the form of the back, the shape of the back can be deduced from the form of the front. Simple, yes? So what we see is that the person is, according to Alexander, unduly lifting the front part of the chest and hollowing the back. This is how the person is, uh, well, proposing a solution to the postural problem because there is a postural problem. And there is a reason for this poise of the chest. And I want to show that this, uh, the, the reason why there is this poise of the chest is because of the solution to the postural problem. What we see is that the front of the chest, the center of the torso, which is the, the greatest mass of the body, is very far forward of the axis of rotation of the pendulum. In normal physics, this means that the person is falling forward. But no, she's not. Uh, what happens is that uh, the person is not falling forward. As you, you, as you can see, uh, the person is standing. So there are other forces that are preventing the person from falling. Some are coming from an overactivity in the muscles of the leg. But another one is that the person is uh, making adjustments to, that are going to occur in anything you ask. For example, I ask the person to touch with the index finger and you will find that the person is projecting the shoulders back. The person is uh, of course not aware of dealing with the postural problem. This is a young, very strong, uh, very strong young man uh, that would not recognize any postural problem. He does not know he's got a postural problem for him. This is absolutely, uh, well, his habitual uh, relaxed pose. He's not aware of any movement he's doing. Is not aware of the strain is imposing and is not aware of the limits uh, is imposing on his uh, breathing mechanism either. So we have a first of all with Alexander indication we have a better understanding of uh, the mechanical 
conditions. So Alexander that says that uh, the release of the neck depends from uh, the correct use of the component parts of the mechanism of the torso. Well, uh, this is quite obvious. When you look at it in this way, you think, yes, how could you imagine that that person could have the neck free? Uh, first of all, you will find that the height of the shoulders, when we are asking the person to lift the, the finger, well, it's not that high, you know, the, uh, the front of the pelvis, but the person in order to lift the finger is lifting the shoulders. The person has a habit of shortening the neck muscles, of in fact, stiffening the necks in every, the most uh, simple activity, pointing with the finger and the person is lifting the shoulder above the sternum bone, which is, if, if I was doing it, I, I would be looking like this. It's like, uh, it's amazing. The, uh, the waste of, of, of effort, of muscular effort, has no relationship with the task that the person is asking to perform. It's obvious that uh, this is part of, the, of a habit that is much deeper than doing things. It's standing, it's uh, solving the postural problem. So we, we uh, begin to understand, and that's what I wanted to show here, that there are uh, defects. Alexander called them shift particularity, peculiarities. And so what he indicates as uh, shift peculiarities are an incorrect mental attitude toward the respiratory act. Well, uh, yes, uh, there is an incorrect mental attitude because the person is not standing to breathe. The person is standing to uh, maintain his balance, by, which is indicated by having the middle torso very, very far forward of the zone of support. So as a result, the person is unduly lifting the front part of the chest, stiffening the chest. And when you unduly uh, lift the front part of the chest, um, Alexander points out elsewhere that, and you can make the experiment anytime, it's very simple. You, you get your, your palms against the side of the lower rib cage, and you will find that when you try to unduly lift the front part of the chest, yes, you will find that you are expanding the distance, you're widening the front of the rib cage. Yes, but at the same time, if you use the sum and place the sum on the back, on the middle back, you will find that yes, you're unduly lifting the front part of the chest, opening uh, the ribs at the front, but you're, you're really closing down your, your back. Your back will be uh, under your sums. You will discover that your sum are going forward, of course. As we said, if the ribs are going forward, the, the front end is going forward, the back end, well, is also going forward. So the back end will be going forward and will be very, very markedly narrowing. And you will find the flabbiness and the all old back that Alexander described all the time that is present in the image you have on the screen here. So, there is a lack of control over and uh, what Alexander calls an improper and inadequate use of the component parts of the different mechanism of the body, starting, of course, with the mechanism of the torso. Uh, when Alexander talks about the body, he, he, it's quite interesting to see that he, called, he talks about the body and the limbs the body, the limbs, and the nervous system. So it's quite interesting to see that for him, the body is something that uh, at least comprise the torso and certainly the head and neck, but not the limbs. So inadequate use of the component parts of the different mechanism of the body. That translates directly in incorrect movements. There is a movement in order uh, to bring the middle torso forward. There is a movement to bring the upper sternum backward. And with the upper sternum, of course, you remember there are ribs associated and there are the upper vertebrae. So uh, that person uh, would lie down on a table with the top of the thoracic spine touching and the sacrum touching the, the, the table. There would be a hollow in the back, yes? That's how you would see that person. 
And so a lack of control over uh, an inadequate use means uh, an inadequate direction of the movements of the different parts of the torso. And you could say, if you want to make it simple, because uh, I found that uh, when I ask people to direct uh, vertebrae, they have no idea what I'm talking about. They, they cannot locate vertebrae with their feelings. Uh, or if they say they do, they simply hallucinate. Well, it is very simple to stick a finger and to start to find that, yes, there are particular ribs that can be, um, well, located. We have a narrative to locate ribs and uh, locate uh, any part, any bony part that is associated with the spine. The front of the pelvis is associated with the spine because uh, if you move the front of the pelvis backward, I can tell you that the sacrum is going to move backward with it. There is no other way. So you can start to think, OK, we could combine some movement backward of certain parts of the torso and certain movement forward. And then you start to imagine uh, what we would call the pose of the body. The pose of the body is a relationship between the torso and the legs above the ankle and the chest poise. Yes, the chest poise means that uh, you have a, an object that you look at. You look at something that is a, a, a rib cage, a rib cage that can move uh, relatively to, uh, of course, the pelvis. And if you can move the rib cage relatively to the pelvis, you understand that you can suddenly, well, create what we call new orders, which are means whereby to lengthen and widen the back. So there are defects in the, cent the standing position uh, and in interfer and interference with the normal position and shape of the spine, as well as the ribs, the costal arch, the vital organs, and the abdom abdominal viscera. This is how I started my quest for, uh, well, recreating because uh, I had to recreate my understanding of the Alexander technique because Alexander gives us ends in order to reason out what the means whereby could be but there are no direct uh, uh, teaching in the sense of uh, you must think this way you must do this you must do that Alexander leaves everything open so it was necessary for me to uh, look at it. Uh, what is the correct standing position? Alexander says there is, there is no such thing as a correct standing position. Yes, there is no such thing as a correct standing position uh, because the question is not of a correct position. Uh, the idea is studying the means to assume a correct position, which means that there is a question is a question of correct coordination of new orders of the mechanism concern. So uh, when I look at uh, a person, I look first of all, Alexander explained, we have to, to have in mind this uh, this idea of correctness of the conception of the act to be performed. When I, I start working with a teacher, so I, I had a lesson last week with a modern Alexander Technique teacher, and um, I've hidden the, the face so that nobody can know who it is. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. So, uh, the activity is very simple. The person is uh, seen sitting. Uh, that's her habitual sitting position. I've asked her to use a wooden uh, pole, a wooden stick. She's uh, pointing to a wall with a wooden stick here. And on this image, I've asked her to uh, reverse. Well, she has changed hand, of course, but to reverse uh, the position of the, the stick. I wanted her to, to discover what I mean by widening the upper back. 
So let's start with the, the, what I see first. I can very quickly ask the person to locate and uh, pinpoint on video where are the, where is the top of the sternum, the bottom of the sternum, and the front of the iliac spine. Again, uh, the anterior superior iliac spine is the front part of the pelvic bone. And so, uh, from the start, you you may look at a picture of a person sitting and think, well, it's, it's it looks quite nice. Finally. Well, uh, there is a problem is that uh, we are often, uh, uh, in fact, making mistakes because of uh, our habits of looking at people. And second of the fact that we, are, we haven't got the hands on the person. So you, you need a way to, to, to read how a person is standing, how a person is moving. And so to read that, you need to have the person locate different bony spots that is done during the video. So the person has uh, different um, scenes where she's uh, pointing to different spots so she can make an idea of how she looks. Yes, how the bony organization of the part is. And in that case, there is uh, the, well, the undue lifting of the front part of the chest is absolutely immense. It's impossible to miss, yes? It's absolutely obvious that the top part of the sternum is very much further away from the wall than the lower part of the sternum. So it means that uh, the higher vertebrae are quite far back and that the vertebrae that is related to the one you see here is about uh, at the center of the back. Uh, you, can, you can absolutely be sure that that person is really arching and that Alexander is correct. When there is an undue lifting of the front part of the chest, the protruding abdomen, the abdomen is protruding. If you look at the, if I draw a line between uh, the lower sternum and the uh, front of the pelvis, it's absolutely obvious that the lower, the middle ribs, which are for us the, the lower ribs, are protruding forward and they are expanded while the back is uh, shortened and narrowed. Narrowed because it's shortened, as I've explained earlier. So we, uh, we suddenly uh, discuss the physical understanding that the person has. I want to know uh, how the person relates what is happening at the front with what is happening at the back. These are questions I'm asking. I'm asking the person, uh, is there any relationship between uh, well, the rib that you, you are touching and the vertebrae at the back? At first, the teacher is, is uh, surprised that I could ask such a question. It's not a question you're asked in the Alexander Technic lesson normally. It's necessary to ask the question because it's necessary to have the person reason. I'm going to ask the person to reason and I'm going to ask the person to touch the lowest, lowest ribs on the side. There is a spot, you see, and I've asked the person to locate, you see, the person is placing an index finger on a very definite bony spots on the side of the rib cage. And uh, uh, in the second image, the person is doing a readjustment in two seconds. I will explain in a second. And uh, we are absolutely certain, the person and myself, that the person has moved that index finger very further back than the usual position. So with the upper uh, sternum bone and with the lowest ribs on the side, we can get a very clear idea of the shape of the ribcage object seen from the side. We can get an idea of the poise of the chest. And uh, in that case, it's, it's clear that in her standing position, in the sitting position, sorry, it's absolutely obvious that the person has, uh, well, the ribcage very far rotated forward and down, and very far rotated backward and up. It's obvious. Yes, but that has consequences with the back. That's what Alexander was explaining with uh, unduly lifting the front part of the chest as a peculiarity, as a, as a defect, yes? And so we are going to ask the person to create a combination of movements. In order to combine movements, the person has to manipulate the ideas in her mind. 
She has to understand that what we are requesting is at the same time to have the lower ribs move backward away from the wall and the upper ribs are to move forward and up because we are going to locate the center of rotation on the lower sternum. When uh, the rib case poise is changed, the upper vertebrae of the thoracic region are going to go forward and up. As a result, the, of course, cervical vertebrae are going to go forward and up with them and the head will be much more forward and up. So I asked the person a procedure. I said to the person, I'm going to ask you to perform three movements at the same time. And uh, when you are going to tell me that you understand the movements I am discussing, I will ask you to perform uh, a count of three. You are going to say one, two, three. One is the start of the movement you're going to perform at the same time. And three is the end. At three, I want you to stop all movements. And we are going to study the means of performing this new uh, organization we call lengthening the back. So this is what happened. I asked the person, first of all, to be able to direct the tip of the ruler to the lower part of the sternum. And this, uh, um, for me, is uh, making certain that uh, the person will have to bring the shoulder further forward than it is in our habitual use. In our habitual use, the upper shoulder is much further back relative to the middle ribs. So in asking the person to place the tip of the ruler on the lower sternum, the person has to, in fact, extend the arm, extend the shoulder, lengthen the back. It's absolutely obvious that uh, uh, she will not have to think of, uh, uh, in fact, widening the largest muscle of the back, that is the latissimus dorsi, because this is going to be performed by the activity she's re requested to perform. So that one is uh, one action. The second action is, uh, of course, uh, to get uh, the lowest ribs on the side of the torso to move backward, which is away from the wall. Uh, to make certain at first, it is uh, only the first attempt, so I'm not uh, uh, too keen to have her only work with her conscious mind. I've also, because she's an Alexander teacher, I've asked her to have a finger on it. Um, it's absolutely not necessary, but for a person that is uh, that has been trained with the somatic technique, it's better. Uh, the person will direct her mind to what she feels, of course, but it doesn't matter for a start. We are in so interested in coordinated uh, constructions that um, uh, Alexander talks about creating a coordination. That person is starting to create a coordination that is totally different from what she's used to. And so the person is absolutely clear that she wants to direct these uh, lower ribs on the side of the torso backward and upward. I asked her whether she thought it was uh, humanly possible to have the lower rib go away from the chair. What, was it possible to lift the lower ribs? Uh, if you don't mind uh, stretching uh, all the muscles of the lower back, if you don't mind this feeling, uh, would it be possible? And she found out, yes, yes, it's possible to really, uh, as she said, strain the muscle, <laughs> which is a, a correct uh, word, meaning that there is a mechanical geometrical stretch applied to the region. Yes. So I asked her to really move the lowest ribs backward. And I said to her, considering the top of the sternum, I said to her, uh, for the moment, the relationship between the bottom of the sternum and the top of the sternum is such that, as we see on the first image, the top of the sternum is further away from the wall than the lower sternum. So we must understand that when we are going to move the lowest rib backward in space, um, we want the lower sternum to move back because we want to action two uh, ideas at the same time. We want the lowest part of the sternum to go back while the upper part of the sternum is going forward. 
I really explain that we are discussing a rotational movement. Well, I do not explain, I ask sufficient questions for the person to realize by herself that we are discussing rotation. And so if there is a rotation around a, cent a center that is on the front of the rib cage, uh, the lowest ribs are going to go back and up and the upper ribs are going to go forward and up. Yet, this is only the first part because uh, the second part is what we are going to perform now is the conscious control because that is what the person has done after two seconds. We see where, where she is. You have to understand that to uh, will uh, such a long ruler and bring it to a lower point, uh, a mind has to be dedicated. It's, it's not that easy to really uh, aim with uh, a small tip of a ruler. She has to aim for the lower part of the sternum. At the same time, she has to move uh, the other finger further back and upward. And uh, we expect her to move the upper chest forward and up. That's the idea. Uh, now we need to consider uh, the second part. The second part of our sentence is uh, uh, the standard of functioning, the standard uh, of performance in physical acts. So it depends upon the degree of correctness of the conception of the act. We've discussed this with the pupil, but now it depends also upon the degree of coordinated employment of two things. One side, there are the guiding and controlling orders of directions. So here we have a series of three orders of movements that have been explained, discussed, modeled, so that the person uh, has an idea of what movements and what parts should be moving together, all together. Uh, but th th that is not the only thing. We also need a coordinated employment of these orders with uh, the, the mechanism involved in carrying out the activities essential to the correct means whereby the act can be performed, lengthening the back. So now we, we are lear learning that uh, giving instruction is not sufficient. Yes, uh, it was planned that the person was going to uh, lift and pull back the lower strips. Uh, if you observe what has happened, it's not exactly what we asked because in fact, the person has gone down and back. The person has a facility to go back and down with the lower strips. At the moment, uh, uh, the coordination between the instruction going back and up with the lower strips and, well, the activity is essential, is not there. The person, for the moment, is not capable of, in fact, uh, subordinating the acts essential to the instructions. She wants to perform the instruction, but apparently there are something that is uh, that are hindering a progress. At the same time, we see, of course, that uh, it, it was never a question of uh, trying to uh, go low with the lower sternum. The person has collapsed the front as well as the back. So you can see that uh, the sternum is inclined downwards, but uh, it, it marginally so, but the lower sternum has gone down. Look at the horizontal line and you will find that uh, the lower sternum is, is, is lower than it was before. Of course, there has been a, uh, there has been a rotation, but um, uh, the rotation is not the one intended. Uh, of course, there has been a change in the shape of the back. This is not all catastrophic. Of course, uh, the very market curve, the very market shortening of the back is less. Yes, but there is a compression. The, uh, the rib cage is lower onto the pelvis. As the person is sitting on the chair, it's clear that uh, the person has compressed the back. So we give some instructions and the per person will perform the instructions. And we discover that uh, the result is not exactly the one we want. It's necessary to understand that at first, the person has not the, the capacity to subordinate movement to instructions. It's something that the person needs to construct. The conscious guidance plane, uh, well, has no end, of course, 
but it, uh, you could say that it has a start. At first, uh, the person has very little capacity of conscious guidance. This is exactly why there are lessons. We, we, I'm, I'm not uh, requesting the person to use our conscious control in order to achieve this or this or this. No, the idea is about constructing and reaching the plane of const uh, constructive control. Yes, and conscious control. It's not uh, using the conscious control you have. Uh, there is very little. As soon as you ask a person to perform three actions at the same time, you find uh, uh, that the person can only perform uh, what her sensor appreciation allows. The, the, the whole game is going from there to start to emancipate the person from the feeling guidance and discover that she can do much more, that she can reorganize the movements of the parts in completely uh, a new way and unknown for sensory guidance. She can discover new things. So there is something that we will see is that when the person is asked to uh, move the hands and for example, lift the hands and the elbow because uh, uh, at first the hand was resting on the leg, the person has to, to in fact uh, direct the movement of the hand. When the person is directing the movement of the hand, the person is directing the movement of the elbow and the shoulders nearly faster than the hand you would say that she's lifting the hand by lifting the shoulder. This is interesting. This is not what we want. But this is going to be the start of uh, our discussion about the conceptions of the movement. I will ask the person, do you think it's absolutely necessary to lift the shoulder, to lift the ruler that is weighing, I don't know, uh, 50 grams? Of course, the person will say no. So then we are going to start a fundamental part of teaching the initial exam technique is what we call disassociating movements. The person must start to disassociate the movement of the shoulder and the movement of the elbow from the movement of the hand. It's a, it's a very simple start, but it's, uh, it's, for example, what Alexander explained in hands on the back of a chair. There is a light pull outward and slightly downward of the elbow. Well, you could, you could imagine a light pull, slight outward and slightly downward of the elbow in such a way that the hand would stay at the same height, for example, but the elbow would be lower than the hand and the shoulder. And then the person will discover that if she does so, it will tend, uh, if the hand stays in place and she goes out with and down with the elbow, the shoulder will have first to move down. But to move down, the shoulder has to stretch. And here we reach something that Alexander called the reeducation of the kinesthetic systems. Because if the hand stays in place and the elbows goes outward and downward, suddenly the shoulder, well, will have to move relatively to the torso, otherwise the torso is going to go down in space. And so the stretch of all the muscle and large fascia of the back is going to increase. The person is going to feel tension. And of course, uh, because that teacher has been trained to uh, release tension, well, uh, when you've been teach to release tension, it's very difficult to uh, create movements that produce tension, that produce stretch, produce lengthening, produce widening. Any lengthening and widening that you produce that is different from your habitual restricted motion is going to feel like tension. And because the person cannot accept to feel that tension on the shoulder, well, she prefers to have the shoulder lifted and uh, the elbow lifted. It's very simple. So uh, the teaching of release of tension, increase the tension the, per the person is performing in the uh, habitual acts. It's quite interesting to hear. And so we are going to start to discuss conceptions of movements. Why is it that uh, the person goes down when she's asked to go up? 
when why is it that she she transform an instruction to pull the, the, a, a bony spot higher into a movement that we see goes lower well it's because the person has a conception of the rotation of the rib cage poise the person as in what i mean is that the person has already a center that is uh, part of our embodied cognition. When you say rotation, there is a center and the, the person has already a center. And uh, despite all you could say, all you can start to uh, condition as if when I ask the person to have the uh, end of the stick on the lower sternum, it's because I want the person to start understanding that she's to rotate the rib cage around the center that is at the front. It's the only way to go forward and up with the upper thoracic spine and with the cervical spine and the head. Going forward and up means that you rotate the rib cage at the front. This is what Alexander is seen doing with this index finger is, is using this index finger as a rotation point and is in fact modeling how is going to go up with the fingers in order for in fact the rib cage poise to be transformed and become what it is here. Yes, so uh, when you look at the person collapsing, you understand that the person has a center rotation at the back. And if you, if you try and rotate the, the rib cage, even if you try and go up with the lower ribs, you're going to go down with your torso. You're going to go forward and down instead of forward and up. This conception, the person would not recognize as she has it. She does a movement uh, spontaneously. Um, but in fact, it will be shown that uh, it, the person has this conception when she will change that conception for a new reason one. Because when she's going to discover that in fact, she is going down with the lower sternum because she thinks of rotating the rib cage, she will find that when she's able to direct the movement of rotation of the rib cage from the front of the rib cage position of rotation, then, well, she will discover that yes, she was doing it the other way. She has always been doing it the other way. So this is what we call conscious guidance. This is what she's going to discover. Conscious guidance, simple. So I think I've gone, I've gone round. Uh, I want to finish with this image. Uh, it's uh, the start of uh, also uh, a system where the person is, uh, for example, you can see here uh, what I call the, the wall procedure. Uh, it's, it's strange because um, um, both Marjorie Barlow and uh, Wilfred Barlow and some others call it the wall exercise, but uh, there are no exercises in, in the Alexander Technique. This is the wall procedure. So you see the same person as before that is standing upright. That's our, is, is best standing upright. And uh, then you see the person is a completely different organization. In, in two seconds, the person uh, is standing uh, three inches, like eight centimeters away from the gray wall. And I asked the person to fall. I said to the person, there is a wall behind you. You know exactly it's three inches behind you. I want you to fall against that wall. But uh, in order to fall against that wall, you're, give, you're going to give you a series of new orders, which are going to, in fact, uh, rotate the rib cage exactly the same orders for the rib cage as i explained with the lady this gentleman is doing the same but he's adding some orders with the lower part of the torso because we know that the spine is connected with the lower part of the torso so he's changing also the rotation of the pelvis what, what we call the pose of the torso so when the person decides to fall backward well, at first, it's not that easy because the person has the habit of, uh, of uh, stability. The person doesn't like to feel out of balance. So the person is going to fall out of balance. And at the end of the lesson, the person is going to discover that uh, when uh, after falling, that the person is upright. Uh, and the person will discover uh, that this is an upright position of mechanical advantage because if I ask the person 
from that point to fall forward well, the person had really the impression of being back against something, being falling back against something. Yes, if you're falling back against something and you're told to fall forward, well, you have to throw yourself forward. Well, the person is going to discover that in the new organization, the person is falling forward without any effort. Alexander said that to walk, you have to fall forward without any effort. So, it's a pendulum that is rotating very low. And we see, because the person makes no effort to fall forward, either the person is forward, but he can't imagine that he's forward because for him, this is very, very, very far back. Yes, so then if the person is not forward and makes no effort to fall forward, it means that the person is vertical above the, uh, uh, the rotation spot of the pendulum structure. And we can see that uh, as a result of his efforts, the distance between the middle of the rib cage and uh, the axis of the pendulum has shortened. It's not perfect yet, but it's better. To be perfect, it, we, we would have to lift the back a lot more because you see the sternum is still further back. So the only way to get the sternum and the, the top of the sternum and the lower part of the sternum on the same axis would be to continue the poise of the chest and have the back go, the, the lower strip go even further back to, well, get the back back. So this is uh, a conception of the new orders that I had to like invent because um, it was not present in the books. And, um, the pupil is learning to, in fact, apply the means whereby of assuming a position of mechanical advantage. I'm sorry, I've been a bit, uh, a bit long, but uh, it was necessary. Any questions? No problem. Um, I have questions, but let's leave them for the next episode. Um, so we'll stop there today. So for everybody watching the video, if you want to book a lesson with Jean Do, you'll find links underneath. And we will see you again in the next video. Thank you, Jondo.